I'm going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to AICC's bi-weekly bi COVID-19 call. I'm Taryn Pyle, and I'll be hosting this call today. If you are new to AIC's programs, we want to welcome you. We have a few housekeeping de details before we get started. The call today will be 60 minutes long. A recording will be posted via, um, on the website after the, uh, on the Monday following the call, and any materials discussed or offered will be placed on, on the site as well, and you will need to download them to your computer. Um, you all have been on this call before. I just want to let you know that this is an open forum. We want people to be able to discuss, ask questions, and make comments. To do that, if you move your mouse down to the bottom of the screen, you will see that um, a bar will pop up. To chat, you move your screen, move your bar, your um, mouse over to the chat feature. Click on that, and it opens up the chat room where you can post questions or comments. To um, raise your hand and ask a question, you will click on the participants icon, and that will open up. And at the bottom of that um, bar, you will see a lower hand or raise hand. You can do this at any time during the call, and we will call on you once you once your hand is raised. With technology, there's always a possibility of losing a connection, sound, or viewing of the presentation, and we'll keep you posted on the status of any problems using the chat feature. If you lose the connection, you just need to dial back in using the link that was provided to you this morning. If you get, um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to David Goach, our attorney who is going to do the antitrust statement. David? Good afternoon, or good, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Nice to see or hear most of you, but we serve as general counsel to AICC. And just as a reminder, we abide by all federal antitrust laws. We advance the interests of our industry, but we're prohibited by law from taking any step or action that eliminates an element of competition. I'll stop there because I will later go into more of the actual statutes. So, Karen. Thank you, David. And now I'm going to turn it over to our president, Mike D'Angelo, who's going to launch this program. Mike? Thank you, Taryn. Good afternoon, everybody. I join uh, Taryn and David in welcoming you and uh, sharing our appreciation that you're spending some time on a Friday with us. Uh, two weeks ago, Steve Young pinch hit for me in the host's role um, because we've taken this, uh, this video conference to every other week. Uh, Steve is taking a well-earned couple of days off, so I'll be filling his role as uh, putting together the questions and putting that to our speakers today. Before we get to the speakers, just want to do a few updates. Uh, just as this video conference is every other week, we've gone to, uh, rather than a daily update at the AICC COVID page, uh, we present it as a weekly update, but we do periodically update during the week with relevant information. And then just some things to mention that have occurred over the past two weeks. In addition to the fact that there is the first thing that's a bullet point that's always on the COVID update page is uh, a link to the state and local updates, which are consistently now reopenings, as well as unfortunately in some jurisdictions, reclosings. Um, but then there's all their pertinent information that I want to put to your attention. The first one being that the federal government is now opening up the door to national interest exceptions to travel restrictions. This is particularly of importance for AICC members who are installing new equipment, particularly as it comes from European based suppliers there was uh, a moratorium put on travel from many European countries, uh, both in a reciprocal way too, traveling to them from the US is also under restrictions. But uh, as embassies have been reopening in Europe, the federal government has made uh, national interest exceptions and remarkably uh, technicians and experts of that type are included on that exceptions list. So if you were despairing about whether your new piece of European equipment was going to be able to be installed or not, there seems to be progress uh, that's being made there. Um, states are also looking at coronavirus safety mandates in and of themselves. Virginia is launching one um, as soon as it publishes in the Richmond newspaper, which is the tradition down here in Virginia, uh, either yet today or sometime next week. Oregon's looking at it, and several other states are too. So you'll have to be on particular watch for something in your local state jurisdictions if there are 
uh, safety mandates for workers, your employees uh, that may go over and above the federal guidelines at this point in time. Uh, plus the Department of Labor, which we posted this week, uh, put up additional guidance on several acts, the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Family Medical Leave Act, and the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. So you've got to stay current, and we've got links on the AICC COVID update page, which can take you to those. It's all very important as you try and stay uh, out in front of things in your businesses. Um, that's the reason why we have uh, some very interesting content today. Um, where uh, we have two expert speakers joining us on the topic of business interruption planning. David Goach, who's familiar to many of you on this conference call, he's been the AICC General Counsel since 2014, and he's a partner in the law firm of Webster, Chamberlain & Bean in Washington, D.C. Today he is joined by David Lieberman, an associate with Webster, Chamberlain & Bean, who has worked on many AICC matters. Webster, Chamberlain, and Bean is the preeminent law firm for associations and nonprofits. We're happy to be working with them, of course. Earlier this year, at the onset of the pandemic, when states were ordering shutdowns, many members feared having to cease operations for a time if there were positive cases in their plants. Customers of some AICC members asked them about their contingency or business interruption plans if they had to close. How would these customers have their box orders met? Working with today's two speakers, AICC has developed a business interruption agreement template. It's available for download, free for AICC members, in the store at the AICC website. Uh, so we'd like to get into the uh, nuts and bolts of a business interruption agreement. And with that, we'll turn the floor over to Dave Goach. David. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so everybody, let's, let's talk about this. And... And Mike sort of stole some of my thunder. I wanted to acknowledge AICC and shamelessly plug it because to the extent that any of you are wondering what the uh, impetus for this agreement was, in fact, AICC staff received inquiries from AICC members on this issue. What if uh, the corona, as we were all trying to understand what was going on, what if because of coronavirus in my state, uh, there's a problem, I can't deliver on an order, what relationship can I have, and I don't want to get too much into the details about the conversation, but Mike and his team uh, spoke with the individuals, uh, I also engaged with them, and then the resulting contract is what we have to offer. And now to talk about why the contract is in the format that it is, uh, I do want to now go into a little bit of antitrust primer and talk about that. The U.S. economy is uh, based on the primacy of market forces. If you could go to the next slide, Karen. Oh, so. Yeah, I'll just go um, next slide. I gotta figure out how to, there we go. Uh, so we have a free market economy, and that basically is uh, why we have the antitrust laws. And next slide, please. The antitrust laws first were recognized officially in the United States in 1890 with the passage of the Sherman Antitrust Act. And that's the one that's most relevant to associations. Uh, it, it has section one, which all of you who have been annual meetings have heard me regurgitate over and over again, that section one prohibits every contract combination conspiracy and restraint of trade. This is exactly what we're talking about. Uh, so the Sherman Antitrust Act prohibits eliminating any element of competition. Now to give a little historical background then, the application of it directly hits home with contracts. So it's not just about the agreement, it's an agreement to have an agreement. In 1930, the paramount famous Lasky case was decided. Now in that case, two competing film distributors had a, an agreement to utilize a standard form contract for the distribution of their films. That contract contained a binding arbitration clause and the United States Supreme Court stepped in and deemed that illegal. That was restraint of trade. Them agreeing to specific language, a specific arbitration clause was eliminating an element of competition between those two competitors. And that, that agreement and the ability to do that was stricken down in that case. Now, fast forward, 1996, and this isn't the only case, but this is the one I often cite, it's so much on point. Uh, the FTC then applied this specifically to association. 
So in INRI, International Association of Conference Interpreters, in this, the FTC prohibited an association from continuing to distribute a template contract that they had developed, a standardized contract that they had been pushing out to its members, because that contract included substantive provisions regarding price and cancellation penalties. In other words, the association was communicating to its members competitive terms. Uh, subsequent to that, a business review letter was issued by the U.S. Department of Justice regarding the American Trucking Association, and they created what are known as safe harbor guidelines. And these are things that if you do this, the government is, is pre-blessing what you do, but these are the guidelines that you should have for any template agreement. And first, whatever contract used by the association members has to be strictly voluntary. And that means, getting to the very end of this presentation, all of you can take this for what it's worth. Use it, don't use it, use parts of it, what have you, it is your choice. Voluntary goes beyond just the ability to use. It also means the association, there's no retaliation, no retribution, no action against you, you know, how you use it, if you use it, when you use it. This is truly just a suggestion. It's something we're offering as a member benefit. Uh, it obviously doesn't go into the terms that you have with your customers, but it's voluntary. The second condition is that members uh, could choose to use individual provisions. I already talked about this of the model contract to use it in its entirety. Uh, the third is the association AICC when circulating the model contract. Uh, it's left to the individual determination of each company acting independently. So it would then be a violation if a couple AICC members say, we like it, let's all sit down, let's fill in the blanks together, and we'll use that one. That then would be a separate agreement, and that would be an illegal one. And as we have in this, and this gets to a very important consideration, the last uh, requirement under the DOJ business review letter is that all terms in the model contract for rates, for charges, for anything that's a competitive issue be left blank. And I, I'll just give you an anecdotal story. A lot of times when we have developed these, the question is always, well, should the association sort of create the gentleman's agreement whereby uh, the members, if, if one member goes to another member, they say, well, it should be in here that the second party, if you will, the subcontracting party, agrees that they won't try to steal this business, that it's a one and, all, one and done, they're not gonna do anything else. And unfortunately, that type of agreement would be illegal. That would be antitrust. That would be two parties agreeing not to compete with each other. The first party giving the business to the second party, the second party in return saying, I won't take it from you. Uh, you know, my, my sort of kitschy tongue-in-cheek response to that is, although you can't agree to that, you shouldn't agree to that, that would be illegal. Uh, you should obviously choose who you do business with wisely and intelligently. Um, so... You see in the antitrust, the slide, it talks about the scary part about the fines. The one thing I would say is inside that our government is very, very good at is prosecuting antitrust. The federal government has a 91% success rate in prosecuting antitrust. So you know, those violations, I think last year, uh, over $2 billion were assessed in violations. Uh, moving forward, so in terms of what I call the necessity of all this for AICC members, obviously uh, this was triggered by COVID and how it has changed all of us, but to the extent that you might find this useful or circle back to it, it could apply to any situation. It could apply if, if you uh, have a strike, if, uh, if your facility has a fire, if there's something unique to your state, an earthquake, a hurricane, um, or even if, you know, God be willing, you have so much business, it's overflowing and you can't meet all of your customers' needs that this is something that you could turn to and use. Uh, moving forward, David. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, so thanks everybody. Uh, this is David Lieberman here. It's gonna get a little confusing with the two Davids, but uh, we've done this a lot. So hopefully we can uh, make it pretty seamless. Um, so that was a really good introduction, and, and that was a, a really good overview, 30,000 foot level, of how the antitrust laws apply to 
the agreements um, that that we've written and that you you may utilize. Um, I, I want to uh, just reiterate uh, some of the guidelines that Dave was mentioning, uh, laid down by the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, and the U.S. Department of Justice, which really do have sort of concurrent jurisdiction over the federal antitrust laws. Um, and again, I, I apologize. I cannot see which slides are up, so I might just say next slide for for Taryn to to go through and or go back on a couple of slides. So hopefully you guys are seeing the guidelines for the agreement. Dave mentioned the first guideline and it really is perhaps the most important. That is this agreement is entirely voluntary, right? You cannot force or require a distributor, supplier, what have you to enter this agreement with you, okay? However, the agreement is also subject to termination, right? And the, we, as you'll see in a few minutes, we go through a couple examples of the termination clause in the agreement. So voluntary, however, subject to termination. The second thing, and Dave's covered it again, uh, just there cannot be any adverse consequences, right? Retaliation or boycotting for either electing or not electing to enter into the agreement. It's completely voluntary and it would be a violation of the federal antitrust laws if you were to retaliate, boycott the supplier in some way, if they did not elect to enter into the program. Uh, Taryn, next slide, please. Uh, you're there. Great, thanks. Um, there cannot be any vertical agreements or restraints. Um, this is uh, an agreement between firms uh, or individuals at different levels of the distribution or production process. So think of like a ladder, right? You're on a different rung. Okay, and let me just give you an example. Um, an agreement between a manufacturer and a reseller that the reseller will not sell the manufacturer's product at less than X or Y dollars per unit is a vertical uh, agreement. Uh, that is, is illegal. Uh, and that cannot uh, cannot happen. Second thing, and, and, and so now we're not on the ladder, right? We're more now spread out. Right now we're on a table, okay? Now there cannot be any agreement or restraint that's categorized as horizontal. And this is an agreement uh, to restrain uh, potential, potential rivals in some respect, right? So you're on the same playing field, okay? You're not at a different level of the distribution process, it's Coke and Pepsi, right? It's two rivals. Uh, so for example, when an agreement by two competing manufacturers to charge X or Y dollars per unit for a commodity that they sell, that's a horizontal agreement, okay? And you can't, you can't do that. Next slide. Um, we're on an agreement may not, may not be used among parties to divide markets or allocation. Yep. Cut. Great, that, great. Okay. Yep, that's, yep, awesome, thank you. Um, so, as you just said, an agreement may not, uh, mm -hmm. thank you, Taryn, uh, an agreement may not be used to divide markets or allocate customers. Here is, you can't say, I'm gonna create an agreement to just compete in X geographic location, or you compete in Y geographic location, right? You can't divide customers like that. Now, now if that happened, and if that happens organically, right, you guys are just really good at selling widgets east of the Mississippi. Okay, great. That's lovely. That's fine. That's pro-competitive. But you can't have an agreement that states, I'm going to be east of the Mississippi. You're going to be west of the Mississippi uh, in, in a contract, right? That would be a di division of a market for a geographic location, and that would not be okay. Okay. And also, second bullet, you can't deny the provision of goods or services to a common buyer or exclude another. There's the boycott that we were talking about. The agreement must have a beginning and an end date, okay? You cannot have an indefinite term for these kinds of agreements. And Dave touched on it a little bit uh, in his introduction, right? This is a unique situation. Now this doesn't have to be used for something as unique as a COVID, right? A once in a generation pandemic, hopefully. But it does need to be used for unique situations, right? It's something that's disrupting your supply chain to the point that you simply 
can't function as a business. Okay. If, and when that happens, these agreements are okay to use. However, the agreement term length itself cannot last longer than the unique situation. Hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully you're all shaking your head. Yes. Second bullet, the agreement can't be simply an exchange of data. Dave uh, talked about this. It's not just an, an exchange of sensitive data, of prices, right? It has to be something else. However, if sensitive data is to be used, we've written in the template a confidentiality provision that I would ask you guys to take a look at and see if that fits for you. Confidentiality is one of those provisions, provisions excuse me, that you can plug and play with, right? You can put in uh, that data is confidential. You can put in particular business terms that are confidential. You can put in membership lists that are confidential. I would take a look at this provision and I'm gonna go over it in a few minutes and you can sort of plug and play it to see uh, what works for you. These guidelines, as I said, uh, there's a heck of a lot more. Uh, Dave and I just distilled uh, uh, decades long of Supreme Court precedents and uh, agency administrative rulemaking in about eight minutes. Obviously, that doesn't cover all of it. Uh, please see more at, at the two websites I provided, again, DOJ and, and FTC. Okay, those are the overarching 30,000 foot guidelines. Let's jump into um, uh, the term termination, the actual sec, the meat of the agreement, right? As I just said, okay, the term will continue as long, and this is actually in the agreement itself. The agreement will continue for as necessary to achieve the agreement's pro-competitive objectives unless terminated earlier, okay? This is a pro-competitive agreement, right? We're saying it's pro-competitive because it's A, it's good to say that things are pro-competitive, but B, because it is. B, because it is. You can't function as a business unless you engage your distributor, supplier, et cetera, in an agreement like this during COVID, during World War III, during uh, what have you. But this agreement is subject to termination, right? One, one observation is just so everyone can visualize this, I always call this type of an agreement, it's the best analogy is subcontracting. So this contract anticipates that the provisions of another contract, so even if you're subleasing, there is a master agreement that this is overlaying upon. So when, when David talks about the agreement will continue as long as necessary, the necessary part is the fulfillment of the underlying agreement. So there is this primary agreement that for whatever reason, the variables that we went into earlier, the, the party that is now seeking for a secondary party to fulfill it uh, is ensuring that that agreement is gonna be taken care of. And then that's a great point, Dave, and that's something that I forgot to mention. These terms do not replace that overarching agreement. Okay, they supplement it, they add to it, they do not replace it. Fulfillment of the entire agreement is contingent upon both the terms being fulfilled. So that's a really great point, thanks for mentioning that. Termination, right, completely voluntary. However, the agreement may be terminated, right? We have in the template that it may uh, be terminated given a specific notice period, right? Usually a 30 or 60 day notice period, but you can go a little bit longer or a little bit shorter. Or, or if the agreement, uh, if one party breaches a material term of the agreement and does not cure within a specified amount of time. So you breach a material term, you're supposed to, your supplier X, you're supposed to supl supply me with widgets. The supplier doesn't supply you with widgets, they supply you with basketballs. They breached a material term of the agreement. If they don't stop supplying you basketballs and start supplying you widgets, they don't cure within a set period of time, 30, 60 days, you can play around with it, then they've breached the agreement. One of the things that everyone should think about, because this then becomes a sort of three-dimensional interaction, is you know, what are the causes for terminating? And I could think of one thing, uh, how transparent is 
this relationship. In other words, if the primary party, the original contract holder, uh, are you making it known to your client that someone else is fulfilling it? Uh, how, how public, for lack of a better term, is this? Uh, because that could change things in how you define termination. If it is a very well-known fact that you're having a subcontractor do it, termination may also hinge on not just whether they can fulfill it, but what if all of a sudden uh, your subcontractor itself gets in hot water because it's in the press for doing something bad or something that's questionable. Uh, all you have to do is open up your paper in the morning and see how you know, whatever company is in hot water for some uh, social media post, some tweet, something that its CEO or an employee might have said. Theoretically, you could put into termination that the first party uh, has the ability to terminate this and otherwise possibly reassign it to another party if that second party, the subcontractor, uh, is currently being uh, viewed negatively or if any action they've taken uh, reflects poorly on the reputation of the primary party. These are things that you need to anticipate or think about to build in here because it's not just in the end getting the job done. It's about getting the job done and preserving the relationship that the primary party has with its customer. And to that point, Dave, I believe that's in the agreement template, right, about being reputational. So again, that's something termination as well as the next section we're going to touch on damages that you can play around with with, you, with your specific situation. Okay, Taryn, let's go to the damages slide if we're not there already. You're there. Um, great. Damages um, here, uh, again, may be assessed if the subcontractor breaches, doesn't cure, terminates this agreement without cause because it's Tuesday, they decide they don't want to perform, breaches a material term, or breaches Section 2C, which was the reputational aspect, okay? I also have in the template agreement as well uh, about a breach um, if the uh, supplier goes into receivership, uh, uh, signs the agreement without notice, or bankruptcy. Um, I put into the template that, that uh, on, you know, notwithstanding anything else, the total amount of damages that may be assessed cannot be greater than what are included in the original agreement, just to not exceed the scope of the original agreement too much. Um, again, something that you can play around with if you like. Um, again, it can be amended as necessary, right? It's all up to your uh, discretion. And just, just so people understand, what David put in the agreement as far as damages, those are actual damages. But again, just being thoughtful, uh, so everyone understands the terminology up here, liquidated damages go far beyond that. Even if the contract value was a million dollars, in a worst case scenario, if whomever you thought you could trust and rely on did something nefarious and they botched the job in such a horrible way that it damaged your reputation, the value of that damage could go far beyond that $1 million. It could mean you lose a client. This could, have been a, this could have been a small job on a very big client. So you get into the issue of maybe in the contract itself, what you ultimately negotiate, that it recognizes liquidated damages. Liquidated damages can also be differentiated based on the type of breach. For example, if it's just, you know, they just didn't fulfill it, there were some aspects Fine, but if it's gross negligence or if it's a willful wanton breach where to the point they intentionally botched it, then it could trigger a liquidated damages provision. And liquidated damages is, a, is an amount that the contract sets out. You could say it's $10 million, you know, whatever number times the multiplier and liquidated damages by its very definition is the parties agree on an amount because to otherwise quantify it through actual actions would be difficult to assess. So in advance of the action that would trigger it, the parties agree that this is what will be paid if you could show that we breached in that fashion. Good point, Dave. Uh, going to confidentiality, um, most likely you're going to be exchanging some sort of information in an agreement like this in which you want to keep confidential and it's proprietary to you, right? Most likely, not all the time, nine times out of 10, okay? 
And most likely it's going to be vice versa, right? The other supplier or manufacturer is going to be supplying you with business operations, strategies, goods and services, pricing, customers, et cetera, okay? It, is, it will behoove you and it would be prudent to have some mechanism to protect that confidential information, right? So we have language in the agreement that states what confidential, what confidential information is and what the receiving party, right? The party that's actually receiving the confidential information. And as you can see here, that could be either the supplier or the manufacturer. What they have to do with that confidential information or what they can't do, action or omission, with the confidential information once the disclosing party discloses it, okay? Um, this is one of those things, and Dave was just talking about damages and, and what you can add. You can add to a damage provision a breach of confidential information would be subject to X amount of damages, would, would cause the agreement to, to be uh, immediately terminated for cause, right? It's a very important provision in, in an agreement like this because most likely you and the supplier are going to be exchanging something that you don't want to get out. One other part about confidentiality, uh, and it's not, it's not explicitly stated in here, this is something that you could flesh out in greater detail, but this confidentiality speaks to the ongoing relationship. In my mind, it's about the fulfillment of that order. But what happens to that information subsequent? Now, a lot of folks usually take the position that you have to maintain this, the confidentiality for X number of years. I'm never really comfortable with that. Uh, a lot of times you can impose on the other party an absolute obligation, and they warrant this, that upon fulfillment of this subcontract, they agree to destroy all confidential information, and you can identify, you can list what that is, or in the alternative, that they agree to return it to you regardless of the form and fashion in which it appears or is stored. Why is that important? Because having warranties like that, absolute representations, that they've either gotten rid of it or that they have returned it, means that if somewhere down the road, a year from now, all of a sudden, that information is showing up elsewhere and it's not just coincidental, that means they retained it. If they warrant in this agreement that they were going to do these things and they didn't, now you have them in breach of the agreement. Despite the fulfillment of the underlying subcontract, this agreement goes out into the future, and then you'll be able to enforce against them. And again, if you were so thoughtful as to put the damages in there, uh, it's a much easier case to make. You don't have to actually prove how you've been harmed, but you can literally invoke that and say, we agreed that they would do this, and if they failed to do it, they owe X amount of money. On to intellectual property. Uh, IP and confidentiality sometimes go hand in hand. Obviously, uh, your IP is proprietary to you. Um, sometimes it can be confidential. You can certainly include in a confidentiality um, uh, your intellectual property, trademark, copyright, um, et cetera. Um, but here, again, there's going to be some sort of IP that, that most likely uh, you are going to be uh, sharing. Um, we've included a may or a shall, right? May is permissive, shall is required, um, and you're going to be licensing it to the other party. Um, uh, sometimes what we've seen in, in agreements is also linking any breach of, of this licensure of IP to, to an immediate termination for breach, uh, an immediate termination for breach with damages. Um, uh, so just something to be aware of. The other element about IP and why contracts matter in my mind is there's a thoughtful element to it. Intellectual property, for example, your name, your company's name, you know, any unique logo that you have that you've registered, i.e. You know, trademarks, service marks. Do you want to allow the other party to use those during this contract? You know, if, you're a, if you're a big company X, and again, you can't fulfill this, and then you're subcontracting to, a, you know, essentially a competitor. And if they're allowed to then put on their company website, hey, we're a, we've been tapped by company X to help fulfill them, you know, we're hot stuff. 
you know, you've literally given them a wonderful marketing opportunity. I'm not saying that's good, bad, and different. Again, these are choices that you make, but do understand that if in the contract you are licensing to the other party certain intellectual property rights, envision or at least try to imagine the way they could leverage it to, to at a minimum, their, their benefit or worse yet, also your detriment. You know, these are things, you know, holistically, how is this arrangement playing out in your mind? Is this literally, as I called it earlier, this conduit pass through, but no one knows who's helping you? Or is it fine that the other party can, can build and get reputational benefit from it? Next slide, going to indemnification. Uh, indemnification is, is a uh, release of liability from one party to the other. Um, you see it very frequently in contracts like the one we've written. Uh, we've expanded the indemnification where both parties will indemnify, again, hold harmless, defend, uh, not just the party, but the party's officers, employees, agents, directors, etc. Um, this is one of those provisions that you can really play around with. How liberally do you want to indemnify the other party, right? What are you willing to accept? What kind of liability are you willing to accept for their screw up, right? Here we have, uh, we're going to um, indemnify you for a breach of the agreement unless the breach is due to the negligence or willful misconduct of the indemnifying party. Okay, and releases uh, actually means the employees, agents, successors, directors, officers, etc. So, yeah, we can understand some some minimal mess up uh, breach of the agreement. We might be able to indemnify you for that, but we are not going to indemnify you due to your negligence or willful misconduct. We often see uh, illegality in there. We often see fraud in there. Um, anything along those lines in which you're simply not going to indemnify the other party for. Interestingly, in nearly 30 years of practice, and I don't know why, but that provision, indemnification, is the scariest little provision in a contract. And I can't tell you how many times I've had to, uh, to argue with opposing counsel. They want to remove indemnification, and it's, it's beyond me. And it's always one of those aha moments, but I literally, and this is that gut check moment, I say to the other attorney, so basically all indemnification is, as David pointed out, is your client, the other party, agreeing that if they make a mistake, if there are damages, injuries, they're going to stand up for what they do. And it's always a wonderful moment, and I've never gotten a good answer to this, asking the opposing attorney, so you're basically telling me your client's not willing to guarantee their work, that they don't do quality work, that they're not gonna do what they say. Is that what you're saying? Is that why you wanna remove this? And it always leads to that pause in the, in the conversation. No, 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 that's not what we, you know, indemnification, particularly mutual indemnification, which is what we've written, it means each party is just gonna stand up for what they do. I think it's the fairest provision, but as I said, it's interesting to me that so many people push back on this concept of indemnification. Force majeure uh, in Latin uh, literally means... Uh, no one's heard of force majeure, right? It's a <laughs> nothing out there happening. <laughs> intervening event, intervening cause. It's likely uh, that you've heard of it, obviously, with COVID. Uh, it really is um, an act of God, right? It's COVID. It's, it's a fire. It's an earthquake. It's something that makes the agreement uh, impractical, impracticable, inadvisable, illegal, impossible for a party to perform, right? You, you have a hotel contract. Uh, you're going down to Miami Beach, and Miami Beach is wa washed away in a storm, right? You simply cannot perform the agreement because of this intervening event. Um, we also included uh, a clause that says, if the manufacturer believes it will impair its ability to, to perform. So not if it, uh, it, not just if it does impair, if the manufacturer believes that it will impair as well. Um, second bullet, uh, I, I thought this was important to add into the template. Um, 
you can have a force majeure event, again, for this supplemental uh, business interruption agreement, but the subcontractor, subcontractor cannot invoke the clause for the reason that this agreement is being entered into itself, right? They can't invoke the clause for COVID-19, okay? They can't invoke the clause for World War III if World War III was actually going on, okay? I want to I want to spend a little more time on this because uh, I don't want to gloss over the fact force majeure has been an interesting evolution contractually because when I started practicing, if you read these provisions, it was as David said just act of God, but that has been expanded and it is something that is negotiated. It's not just hurricanes or you know, floods, you know, locusts. Buffalo stampedes, uh, it now expands into things like strikes, uh, prohibition of air travel, terrorism. You know, these are things that are not traditionally identified as being acts of God. So the contract, the good contract itself, shouldn't just rely on the traditional act of God statement. It should be exactly what you think or the potential. What if, an, what if a fire impacts their business? Is that force majeure? Uh, so you need to define the scope. The other thing too, and I look at the language, which is really Im important. When I started practicing, it said, whatever the act is, the, the force majeure event makes it illegal or impossible. It's really the last two words and they're the least significant one because I would submit to most people, uh, illegality means the government says you can't do it. Okay, I get that. But that's a very, very high standard. Impossible. You know, I always say jokingly, nothing is impossible. So we have sensed, and this has been a process, and we've, this is something that AICC has benefited in other ways. This is something that we spent years as a firm sort of building out in hotel agreements, because this is often where force majeure is included, but to include that makes it commercially impracticable, inadvisable. Those are impracticable means if we're having an event and 30% of our members can't come for some reason, that's not illegal or impossible, but that does then start triggering the other standard of what's impractical. So it's really important to understand what the triggering events are. Also, force majeure is a unique provision because it has to be viewed both in terms of time, scope, and geography. We talked about scope, but the other two, time and geography, uh, just anecdotally, I can tell you stories where when Katrina hit New Orleans, uh, I had clients that had conferences in, in New Orleans that were scheduled for a year later, and they're saying force majeure, and I'm like, that's, it's not time right yet. You don't know whether or not they're going to be back up. So that sort of checks the time box. Whatever the event is, is it really, does it have a causal relationship in terms of time to it? The other geography, you know, again, using a hurricane, if a hurricane, hits Florida, really geographically, that probably wouldn't be force majeure. You couldn't invoke it to then impair or impede the performance of the agreement if the agreement's being fulfilled in California. So you have to look at force majeure in, in the context of what a reasonable person would and whether or not it's something that, that entitles someone to trigger it. But what is unique about this is what David said, that second bullet, that the the force majeure, the intervening event that caused, necessitated this agreement to never be invoked again. Well, and thanks for the elaboration, Dave. That's, that's so true. It is so important to look at, uh, if it's impossible, what does impossible mean? Is it impractical? What does impractical mean? Those are two very different things. And you're right, impossibility, illegality is a very high standard commercial impracticality isn't as high of a standard. So that's a really good point. Uh, next slide, relationship of the parties. Look, you guys are in an agreement together. You are contractually bound with this subcontractor, okay? Ergo, you have some form of legal relationship in which you can bind each other. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in an agreement. Dave Light wanted to call this a joint venture, a joint venture or a partnership. I completely agree, right? That's what this is for this very limited period of time that the agreement is going on for, i.e. 
COVID-19, okay? Mm -hmm. But, but let's be clear here. This agreement is strictly, I'm sorry, this relationship, whatever you want to call it, is strictly for the term of this agreement, okay? After termination, after force majeure, after the contract is just completed uh, on its own, uh, organically, the partners will not be classified as partners, joint venturers, et cetera. Why is this important? Because the, in order for you to take full advantage of the agreement, you are going to need to rely and to be bound by, by the other party and what they do and don't do. But as soon as the agreement's over, the last thing you want to be, the last thing you want to do is be bound to any actions or omissions of the subcontractor, right? That's a form of agency, right? Right now, you guys are agents of one another. You are bound to each other for the term of the agreement, good and bad. But the last thing you want to do after the agreement ends is be on the hook for any act or omission that causes some sort of, uh, of illegality or some sort of lawsuit in which you could also be bound, okay? So that's why we have any kind of legal, legal relationship is strictly for the term of the agreement. And you are not an agent of the other as soon as the agreement ends. Real quick, for those of you, and I'm, I'm looking at the agreement on my phone, so anyone who's looking at the agreement and not just the slides, I wanna back up uh, two provisions. It's not in the slides, but it's something that often people overlook and section 13 deals with governing law. And just a quick observation, to me, governing law, where this agreement would otherwise be interpreted. Now, if both of the parties are in the same state, if they're both in Virginia, Massachusetts, California, then that's a simple selection. But in the off chance that there are different jurisdictions involved here, one party's in Virginia, the other party's in Maryland, to me, governing law, it's, it's like in a football game. It's home court advantage. You know, you're, you're playing on your home field. You know it. You know, even though they say justice is blind, there's a lot of uh, presumption that courts in certain jurisdictions will favor their own citizens. These are important decisions. And, and quite frankly, when it comes to negotiating agreements, to me, whoever gets that, it's like winning the coin toss. But I ever say, whoever gets that home court advantage, they had the leverage in the negotiation. Because again, it's not, a, it's not the hugest deal, but if it's the decision between Look, if I've got to drive or fly to another state, if there's litigation and I have to get local counsel and I have to learn where I'm going as opposed to if this ends up in court, I'm sleeping in my own bed the night before and I'm driving to the local courthouse, it makes a difference. So just something to think about. A lot of people don't often spend a lot of time with that. Uh, I'm not saying I would ultimately call it a deal breaker, but it does to me signal in a negotiation, who did a better job based on who ended up getting the governing law if there is a difference in jurisdiction, if they got their way. And then lastly, um, cooperation between the parties. Um, this is sort of a, a more wishy-washy provision um, uh, that, that we put in. As you can tell, Dave Goach is a really wishy-washy guy. Um, that's why we added it. Um, but basically, it's, it's to in, ensure that, look, you, you guys are not adverse, right? This is most likely a, a, um, a business partner that you've been dealing with for some time, or, or it's a first-time business partner um, in, in that uh, you want to, to do well by them, and they want to do well by you in the future, and this is your first uh, engagement with them. And so cooperation between the parties simply states it's your intention to operate between, between both of you uh, with fairness um, and with the goal of, of a good positive outcome for the agreement. So even before the questions, if there are any, uh, the only other observation is that it's a, you know, again, this doesn't deal with the terms. I have never professed to be an expert <laughs> in, in your industry as far as contractual provisions, but this is a good relationship agreement. This is, as I said, I call it a joint venture or a partnership. Uh, I think there are other provisions you could add, but then you start getting into more onerous language where the agreement is clearly favoring one, one side or the other. But at the end of the day, going back to less the DOJ guidelines, but obviously invoking them, these are provisions or this is language that's all up to the, the two parties to negotiate. 
to develop the relationship so there's a complete understanding of, of the expectations of the parties to ultimately fulfill that agreement. Uh, I will circle back to my earlier statement just if anticipating any question or comment. You know, obviously on its face, I can never guarantee that whomever is contracting this out is going to keep the business. We can't have that provision in there. We can't restrict someone from going and soliciting business then. Uh, but otherwise, we can ensure that the job that was supposed to be done is done well, done correctly. And then beyond that, it is, you know, for better or worse, it's a free market economy. Okay. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. We appreciate that. There's a few questions. Uh, the, the first one was, where can we get this template? Virginia has... Uh, right. Sorry? Virginia's posted a link to that uh, template, <clears throat> which is at the AICC website in the store. Uh, it is free to AICC members, as I mentioned before, uh, but you have to log in in order to get the... Uh, the no cost uh, download. Uh, so we do have a couple of other questions. One is uh, apparently stems from some confusion. Is the underlying agreement the actual job that the member needs the subcontractor to execute or is it the executed template document? The underlying agreement is the job that's being done. The underlying agreement, the master agreement as I'm calling it, is whatever job that by virtue of the, uh, we'll call it a force majeure event, whether it's COVID or it's a fire, but whatever the event that is not allowing that party to fulfill the contract, which was theirs in the first place. Okay. Yeah, and that agreement's going to have the deliverables, um, the, the goods and services being provided, the details of, of what actually the parties are bargaining for or have bargained. Okay, uh, we had another question about force majeure and whether um, uh, the subcontractor can not do the job based on force majeure. And it's, what if the subcontractor has to close due to COVID-19? This is why we have these agreements. Uh, ideally, if, if the agreement that we presented is adopted, then that party would not be able to invoke that. Then the damages could kick in because of COVID-19 was the cause of the, the first party, the primary contractor, whoever had the job initially, from not being, being able to fulfill it. They then turned to their partner to say, can you do it? This is where, I, you know, I'll be honest with you, sure there's uncertainty because some states that were going down, you think, okay, I can do the job, then your state goes back up. And if you're not essential, although fortunately I think in most cases our industry was considered essential, but if that state starts seeing a spike in COVID cases and they get shut down and then that, that plant can't produce, you know, sorry, you signed this agreement and if it does have damages and you're not fulfilling the agreement, uh, you know, it, that's why this was unique. We explicitly wrote the force majeure to exclude essentially repeating the same force majeure event to protect the second contractor. So. That's, that's clear. And then uh, you, may, you may have mentioned this as, as thorough as uh, David and David were in crafting this template. Uh, I believe, uh, and this is, this is me just adding this in, that you are recommending certainly that any member that is going to use the template uh, engage their attorney to help them make it uh, work best for them, correct? Absolutely. It is, it is called a template for a reason. It has blanks. You'll want to craft it to uniquely address your situation. Okay, that's all we have in terms of questions, unless Taryn and Virginia, anyone has got their hand up, which I can't see on my computer. I don't see anybody, but if you want to raise your hand, you can do so in the participant section and just put raise hand and we can call on you. I just want to say I think this was really an excellent, um, excellent call. I think that the the document is really of of value to our members, and I think they'll get a lot of use out of it. Thank you, David and David. Absolutely. Yes. Thanks to the two Davids, and also just a reminder, just a reminder that on Monday, the uh, which I believe is the twenty seventh, uh, we will post the YouTube video of this event 
along with the slides uh, as well. So that uh, the slides contain a lot of information that can be very helpful to you. So you will be able to access those slides uh, Monday morning by uh, going to the AICC COVID page. The link will be posted there along with the YouTube of this video. Uh, and I think there's a lot of detail in those slides. It got my attention uh, early in the antitrust portion where the fines can reach 350,000 per individual or $10 million per corporation. Uh, that will get your attention. And, and, and it failed to mention the antitrust statutes are not just civil, they are criminal. Last year, 15 execs went to jail for antitrust violations. And this would be the type of thing, it's, it's a knowing violation, but the, the FTC loves making a big deal, a big splash when people are incarcerated. Uh, and I don't think anyone on this call wants wants to go to jail. I don't. No questions. Okay. Everyone gets three minutes back on their Friday. <laughs> We certainly appreciate everyone uh, joining us again. Thank you very much to David Goach and David Lieberman for their expertise, for their good counsel, uh, for their trusted advice. Uh, it's always very reassuring to, uh, to hear these things. Uh, take advantage of, of the template. It was crafted with a lot of attention to detail, as I think you can take away from this. Uh, and it can be quite useful for you um, if you have concerns about business continuity uh, in the face of what is seemingly a somewhat resurgent uh, COVID-19 uh, coronavirus. Uh, AICC appreciates your attention, your participation. It's good to see many of you. Some of you were a little more shy today. And we'll wish you a great weekend. And we'll see you again on a similar call very soon. And go to the COVID update page on a regular basis because we're constantly updating it with useful information. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone.